Hello ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the UX World, the voice user experience and strategy podcast. I almost forgot what I was saying there. <laughs> I started reading my notes uh, before I would finish the intro. So there you go. It is the Voice User Experience and Strategy Podcast. <laughs> and today we've got a fantastic episode lined up for you. Uh, we're going to be talking all about internationalizing your voice first experience. The voice first scene and then the potential is is truly global at the moment even this this podcast i mean there's people listening to this podcast in uh singapore uh japan uh, all across europe germany france denmark uh, america canada all over the world and and amazon and the alexa devices reaching globally google are obviously global so i think it's never really been more important for people to start thinking about creating international voice first experiences and today we're going to talk all about that how it's done some of the challenges you might face and opportunities as well so today's guest is a very special guest she is a freelance VUI designer and VUX designer She's worked with uh, smartly.ai and currently with labworks she is Micah Defua hello there Micah hello you all right? Hello, Kane. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. And we've got Dustin Coates here as well. Hello there, Dustin. Hey, Kane. How's it going? Yeah, very well, thanks. I feel as though I'm joined by two extremely bilingual people, and I am not one of those. <laughs> <laughs> are you not? No. How many languages do you speak, Kane? Uh, I can. I can just about. I've just about got the grips of one. <laughs> which which is what i like to call broken english um but yeah i did do uh french and spanish at school but failed miserably and then i did have another stab at spanish because i lived in spain for uh, about six months and i started to pick up some bits but it kind of it, it loses you quite quickly if you don't if you don't use it doesn't it yeah i i think so and well i i think Picking up a language is always better when you're in, in the country, so it goes quite quickly. But I'm sure if you would were to go back, you would get the hang of it again real real fast. Mm. I'm sure I'll get the hang of it by the end of this episode. I'm expecting to be speaking fluent French by the end of this. <laughs> Will you? <laughs> so, you can so, start by saying bonjour. Bonjour. Comment tout appelle. Right. <laughs> you say? Yeah. Quite nice already. I, I, I have no idea what I've just said. There's something about tables. <laughs> <laughs> so so Micah you are French how many other languages do you speak uh, I speak French I speak Dutch I speak German uh, and uh, I also speak English obviously mm. and uh, a little bit of Spanish wow what about you Dustin you must speak a bit of French do you uh, I speak uh, between 30 and 50 percent of French uh, I describe myself as speaking like a drunk child so that's that's about where I am at the moment <laughs> fair enough fair enough it's certainly a lot more French than I speak <laughs> um, so the person the best person then to, to tell us about internationalizing voice experiences has got to be the person who speaks about a million languages <laughs> Micah do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you've got an interesting story about how you got into the whole voice thing haven't you so do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and then afterwards how you kind of got into this whole thing yeah of course uh well i'm Micah Dufour I'm, I'm I currently live in France but I'm actually Belgian uh, and uh, I used to be an insurance broker, so nothing to do with, <laughs> with tech or voice or whatever. Um, but after a really serious breakdown, I had to reinvent myself. So I thought, well, why not be a UX designer? Because I re what I really liked about being an insurance broker is being of service to people, not the whole commercial bit. Mm -hmm. And so being of service to people was something that was really important to me. Also, I have always had a bit of an artistic fiber. I mean, a lot of people told me I was creative. I didn't really believe them. Mm -hmm. But I thought, well, let's give this a go. And then so I did some 
very interesting courses about UX design, really got into UX design for web and G app and apps. And when I saw a conversation technologies take a very popular turn, uh, like first with chatbots and now with mm-hmm. voice, I thought, hey, this might be a thing for me because I, I've, I've always been a writer ever since I was nine years old. I've been writing poetry, text. Uh, I had a literary blog uh, a few years ago as well. So I thought this is like th- this is like the perfect thing for me. It's UX design coupled with writing. It's everything I love. Uh, so I, I thought let's get let's get take a look at what this is going to be about. And well, while I was asking myself lots and lots of questions. Um, I I met a developer friend who said, you should totally do this voice thing. It's going to be big. And I thought, yeah, well, perhaps, we'll see. And then um, I, I, I watch a lot of YouTube videos, like from what goes on across the ocean in the States. And I saw this very like prevalent marketing person called Gary Vaynerchuk talk, talking about voice all the time, all the time. I said, well, okay this might like a lot of people are telling me to do this. So I, I, sh- I should definitely look into it further. Mm-hmm. And, and so I did. And so I, I start, I started taking a few expert courses. I did one with career foundry. Who was a, uh, like, who was one of the only online platforms currently doing very quality driven UX courses. Mm-hmm. Uh, for voice so uh so yeah cool and you've that's kind of taken you to work so you did some work with smartly.ai did you yes i did uh i did uh, i did some work with smartly ai i did some freelance work of my own uh, I have my own skill, like a, a little one, though, nothing, nothing major. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I'm con- I'm also uh, working with Accor Hotels. I don't know if you know who that is. A- Accor, did you say? Yeah, they they it's a group. They have like all the Ibis hotels. Oh, okay. And Sophie Tal as well. I think you might be more familiar with. Mm. Uh, on their conversation design, and I'm um, having a lot of fun working also with LabWorks. Cool. So, what are you up to with with uh, with LabWorks? Uh, so, with LabWorks, I'm helping them internationalize their skills for the different locales, mm-hmm. uh, and also doing some conversation design on the original skills together with Tom Hewitson. So, mm-hmm. but very much fun to be working on games, really. <laughs> cool that sounds good so what's the what's the sort of state of play in fr- apologies actually by the way i said that you were french you actually are belgian i didn't realize that apologies for that um, yes. <laughs> well, um, i've been living in france for 12 years now so i, I guess i'm a bit of folk now yeah, fair dues. so given that and maybe it's dustin you can kind of chime in on this as well given that you also live over there what's what's the uh scene like in france obviously alexa was announced in france recently how how is that kind of going what's the reaction being like to to that uh, there, there are two kind of reactions. The first reaction is the ones of the voice enthusiasts, like the very early adapters that are really glad that she finally shipped to France. Uh, the second reaction is a bit of disappointment as well because uh, people have big expectations for Alexa and they think like it's going to work like a charm from day one and uh, even though everything is put in place by Amazon to prevent kind of the user expectation to be too high and like to avoid disappointment uh, we still we, we still find that uh, users are having quite high expectations for artificial intelligence and that it's not always up to 
what they expect. So uh, I think like, the reactions go both way, both enthusiastic about what it's going to be like and a little bit disappointed uh, about the current state of things because like obviously we 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 only have a few skills now in the Alexa skill store. It's not like in the US or UK where you can find thousands and thousands of skills at the moment. So I, I think it's going to evolve very positively. Um, I also see that uh, Amazon are throwing quite a big marketing budget at this because we get a lot of advertising on the television. Very nice ad, by the way, about... Um, uh, a girl doing her coming out using Lexa. Uh, so, yeah, um, I, I think it's going to pick up like it did in, in the other countries. I also think more and more skills will be developed uh, over the coming months. Uh, like a lot of a lot of game skills, obviously, uh, as well. Um so I know uh, I'm working a bit with LabWorks, who already has a skill live on Alexa France now, which is called Dang. Uh, uh, the equivalent of Would You Rather in the UK. Uh, and so we're, we're also working on some uh, extra cool skills that were, are going to be live in France uh, soon. Uh, one of them is Trivia Hero, which is already live in the UK which is uh, really promising. Uh, other skills that are coming out in France, like not LabOx related, uh, will involve um, hotels uh, as well, um, more a concierge kind of service. Um, I, see, I see a lot of big companies in France getting more enthusiastic about Alexa now. So they are all trying to figure out how to make great user experience, uh, how to get good Alexa skills out there. Also, Amazon is quite um, specific about use cases. Not every skill gets live without like a very qualitative run through. So I, I think that we were up for some very exciting times in France as well. Uh, although getting Alexa shipped to France wasn't an easy task uh, on Amazon from what I gathered. What's your sort of reaction been like, Dustin, from, you know, obviously you work with a lot of French people, live over there in France. What's, what's your sort of experience been? I, I don't think there's been much of a reaction that I've noticed so far. Uh you know, my company is is deeply enmeshed in voice uh, and, and launching more features for voice. So that's what I'm hearing more of from the overall business side. And I think a lot of the people I worked with as well, uh, if they were going to get a device, they already got one uh, shipped in from the UK or the US already. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, all, all the voice, voice enthusiasts just were waiting to be able to change languages in the Alexa <laughs> app. <laughs> So when it was launched, you mentioned that the one reaction of the voice enthusiasts, obviously, and understandably, it's kind of like, finally, kind of thing, you know, it's finally sort of here. But for everyone else, when they launched it, had they launched it as a kind of like a big splash and a big song and dance, like, you know, the AI future is here kind of thing? Is that what's kind of done it? Or, or was it a oh, kind no, of quiet no. rollout? No, uh, from from what I gather, I just... I, I didn't see any particular event. Uh, I saw the information just on social media. Uh, Alexa is now here. We also got an email for the people who like order on Amazon from time to time. Uh, people who are prime Amazon users got a special email saying uh, Alexa is here, blah, blah. Uh, and uh, no, no big worldwide like keynote event. Uh, just uh, a lot of advertising go on television and on social media. So, well, I, I'd be curious to to get some numbers on the like how many French people have already purchased an Alexa, but that's kind of difficult to come by. <laughs> <laughs> one thing, one thing that I'm curious about as we're talking about how people interact with it, as you think about skills, uh, you know, this might be something that's 
unfamiliar with our English speaking audience, but you have the the familiar, you have the uh, sort of polite you. Uh, how does that work with voice first? Are you going more familiar? Are you going more more formal? Oh, it all depends on the skill, really. I mean, it, it's a, it's a it's a question of branding as well. Uh, obviously, with games, it, it's more the familiar you that will be used, and then when when it's uh, skills that will be for brands, I think it's 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 mostly up to them and their users which tone uh, will be used for the skills. So, when when you say familiar. And different types of views. What bearing bear, bear in mind <laughs> my <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my okay, lack so of understanding. In, what what, um, what are we talking about here? I mean, in in in, in French, you have two, which is you as a very familiar person, mm -hmm. a friend, uh, someone of your family, and you have vous, which is an, another you, but for someone that is more distant uh, right. people you don't really know that you've only seen once or twice uh also very funny enough mothers-in-laws <laughs> 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 but anyone you're supposed to be respecting really okay that's safe. interesting yeah kane the i think the best analogy for for english is we used to have the same thing uh you see a lot uh thou uh, yeah. and you yeah uh interestingly that was actually the more informal one and and people wanted to be always be greeted at more formally right so we oh. dropped we dropped that informal uh but english had the same thing as well so it was, it's sort of similar to when you see a lot of thou's and and yeah. whatnot in yeah. old english where, where, is, where is in in in, fr in french uh the, the younger generations use less and less the who uh, form and mm. a, a lot of a lot of people now just on the first time they may say oh let's let's just say let's just be familiar mm. so with the, the the sort of version that you've been testing w will alexa distinguish between those two or w because they both sound fairly similar ish would would there be a clear distinction between the two or would that be something that would be kind of glossed over and it would understand no matter what you said which one you used oh she 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 understands both um uh, i mean I, as the, ge the general alexa says both but i i can't really see people like being on, on mm. I, I i think it's yeah yeah, when you when you invite uh, her into your home, that's got to be a pretty familiar situation, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> and I mean, it, it it's it's very it's very familiar as a situation, and even I, I think it will become it will become so more and more because I see how my little girl, seven year old, uh, interacts with Alexa, and really, it's it's a very natural thing. She doesn't even think about it. In the morning, she gets up and she says, "Alexa, what's to what what's today's weather forecast?" Just to know what clothes she'll put on, and mm. well, she'll ask Alexa for a joke so that she can tell her friends <laughs> in like during recreation uh, in school. Uh, and she, weirdly enough, she doesn't she doesn't really have this kind of distance with technology at all. Mm. Uh, and, and I think voice makes that possible. Voice like kind of takes away the barriers between technology and people. Mm. And speaking of removing barriers, one of the, uh, one of the <laughs> huge tall barrier will be that if there is a experience or skill or action that isn't in your language, um, that's probably one of the biggest barriers that they, that they will be. So let's have a chat about then taking something that is in one language and translating that into something that's in 
another language. So what's, first of all, I mean, we, we've kind of mentioned a few reasons why you would want to do that. The, the space, the voice first space and technology in general and the whole world since the internet, really, it's now, uh, the world is a lot smaller than it was, isn't it? And, and obviously uh, there's a huge barrier to for brands and, and anyone who wants to get their kind of skills or actions used. One of the huge barriers is not having it available in a language that somebody else speaks. But what are some of the other reasons why you might want to consider internationalizing your voice first experience i mean the the one of the main reasons is that there's a lot a lot of people that don't speak english i mean it's i mean it, when i looked up the numbers i was so amazed because it's six billion six billion people in the world don't speak english wow. at all that is a lot <laughs> yeah, that is a lot. And I, I was I was really amazed by that number because I th- I thought that like, we have this kind of perception that everyone speaks in English. I, I don't know why, because I, it's a very widespread language, obviously, and most people speak English, but there is mm. a lot of people still out there that don't. Uh, I mean, one out of five people in France, for example, uh, don't ever bother learning mm. English or speaking mm. a, a different language. So, so yeah, that, that, that's one of the reasons. There, there's a lot of users out there that you won't be able to reach. Another reason is obviously, well, marketing strategy. I mean, you wouldn't today as a brand uh, think about making a website just in your language. Mm you'd obviously like make one for each uh, country you want to be distributed in. Mm -hmm. And other than that, I think we now live in a bit of a global culture where a lot of people live abroad. A lot of people don't really stay in the country they've been born in. Mm -hmm. Look at me. (laughs) (laughs) And Dustin, I, I, Dustin I, moved I, across I the pond. I've lived in I've lived in in France now for a few years, and I'm originally I'm originally from Belgium. So, yeah, I I think I think you as a brand you need to go where your users are, and if your users are in a foreign country, you should at least uh, be aware and uh, be considerate of the language they speak. So, mm. yeah, absolutely. And if there's 6 billion people that don't speak English, I've just had a look. There's only 7.6 billion people on the planet. <laughs> there's, it's, it's the vast majority of people. <clears throat> um, okay, then. So what, what, would be, what would be the process then to, to just pick a language, any language, or, to, or we, can, we can do it in general terms of taking something from one language to another. But from, from the work that you've been doing with LabWorks and the work that you've done with Smartly AI, What's the sort of general process? So if you, you go into a company, they've got a game. Let's let's take a, a, a game situation that's in English. So there's a game, it's in English, and it wants to be translated into, let's say, French. What would be the process that you would go through from walking in and not knowing anything about it to taking it through the process to translate it all and to create a, a French experience? Well, in fact... Um I'd say it's not as much translating as it is transcreating because mm-hmm. for me it's really important that you get a feel of what the experience looks like for the users. I mean, I'm a UX designer at heart, so obviously that's something I was going to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> but but I think it's really important. Uh, I think it's really important because uh, the, ex- the when you have a non-graphical interface. Everything depends on the wording. Everything depends on the experience and the feel. I mean, uh, like Shakespeare wrote, a rose by any other name, right? It still has to be a rose. I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you just translate things, your rose might end up being, I don't know, a weed or 
<laughs> or any other plant, but not a rose. So what you need to be doing is really get a feel of what the original experience is like. Uh, when I was working on one of Labbox's game, I spent hours and hours and hours playing the original game mm -hmm. until I got really fed, fed up with it. But I mean, it took me days. <laughs> so just to, have, to get a hang of it, just to really test the limits as well and see uh, the edge cases. And I mean, that there's a, a lot of real preparation that goes into transcreating a skill. Obviously, you could just, I mean, you could just translate it, tell, tell, tell a brand, just give me the, give me the script and, and mm -hmm. just translate it. Mm -hmm. But the experience wouldn't be the same at all. And if you don't have any idea what the experience is like, I don't think you can really transcreate a skill successfully. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of challenges out there. Um, some words don't exist uh, in, in English. Some words exist in English but don't exist in other languages. Some words don't mean the same thing in one language or another. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the context makes that you have to make little grammatical tweaks and errors. Mm. Uh, so that the experience feels right. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what the experience is like in the first place, that's things you're not going to pick up on just by translating a Google sheet. Mm. Yeah. I've got, um, well, we'll come on to some, some of those things you mentioned in terms of things that don't quite translate well. Um, we'll, we'll kind of we'll come on to that because I found a really interesting, um, really interesting few examples which I'll, I'll test your multilinguality on uh, in a bit. Um, <laughs> but, but so you go in there, then let's just kind of step back to the process. You go in, and the first thing you would do is you would play the actual, whether it's a game or whatever it is, you would engage with that voice experience to understand the the kind of feel and what it's intended to do, what the experience is intended to be like, and then. What would your process be after that? Are you looking at kind of mapping out uh, some sort of flow, or you're looking at all the documentation that they've put together, or what? What, what kind of be the process? What would you do after you've played it and you've got a sense of how how the experience should be? I mean, I, I, I do both. I I first map it out for myself. Mm -hmm. I, I map it out to that because because I'm a conversation designer. I I see how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I map out how I think the skill is built and then I cross check with all the documentation people give me mm -hmm. and then I'll see where things match or don't match, see wh what I missed or mm -hmm. what I thought should be in there because sometimes I, I, I also like give recommendations for the original skill while transcreating it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then from there on, from there on out, uh, once I understand the magic of the skill, let's say, uh, I do a lot of research into user habits about the skill in the country. I mean, there are skills that can be very successful in one country, and uh, people wouldn't give a damn about it in another one. I mean, culture is really important as well. So you can internationalize your skill, but if it's a skill that's not going to sit right with the culture you're aiming at, mm. I mean, there's no use in investing what, in it. What would be an example of, of something where the, the cultural sort of translation, if you like, the, the cultural fit wouldn't quite be the same from one place to another? Uh, it, it, can, it can be anything, but the... There's, there's very typical games, for example, that exist in some countries uh, that, that don't exist in other ones. There, mm -hmm. In Germany, there's a, a game called Stadtland Fluss, mm -hmm. um, which is very typical of Germany. We, ha we have some other games as well in France, but that, that, that's in the game area because that's what, what I'm working on now. But, I mean... Like even cultural skills that are about typical cultural events, uh, like trivia quizzes, for example. There are some trivia quizzes out there 
that only talk about like U S facts or mm. commonly known U uh, S or U K or whatever facts that would be totally inappropriate. Mm. In France, because well, obviously people would get them wrong all the time, and there would be no fun in it. <laughs> yeah, I think that there was another one actually when we spoke to Florian Holland. He was he was mentioning that one of his skills he's built, which is quite popular in Germany. Uh, Mau Mau was it, Dustin? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and and that was I think it's like a German card game, um, which I'd never heard of. I don't, I'm not sure if it existed in in England. So that's kind of one example. And then the other um, thing you mentioned, you did a talk at the um, vo- uh, Chatbot and Voice Assistants London uh, meetup, which Tom Hewitson actually of LabWorks organises. And one of the things I liked about that one was where you were talking about um, X Factor. And yeah. How there's, there's something. What was it? Exactly. X- Explain exactly. What? I mean, X Factor well, in in France had uh, just one season, uh, no success whatsoever. Because I think we had a lot of other uh, quite similar uh, things going on, uh, and so it didn't take on at all. And mm-hmm. uh, whereas in the UK, to my big surprise, it's a very huge success. Everybody knows <laughs> of it. I mean, I have no idea why. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. That um, okay then. So you would you so going back to the the um, process. Then you would play around with the skill, get a get a to grips with the feeling of it. You'd be looking at doing some research and seeing whether or not there is a you know any cultural clashes or anything like that. Um, seeing what kind of um, you know the user behaviour in that particular sort of country. And then when it comes to actually translating it, would you kind of be would you be doing that as you're going through that process or would you go through all of that upfront stuff first and then you would sit down and, and you would try and come up with um, a, a better way of, of phrasing things or doing the translation side of stuff? I, 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 I do both. Uh, I first do all the preparation and then when I get to the actual translation, I translate while playing while playing the skill, while engaging with the skill mm-hmm. uh, even more. And uh, what I also do is um, where I can, uh, where I have the liberty to do it, I take out anything that's too culturally related from the original country, mm-hmm. um, like X Factor, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what I like to do is add some typical locale specific elements. Mm-hmm. To spice it up a bit. Mm. So I mean, I, I mean, I, I think voice user interfaces are are very are, are a very personal experience. So uh, there's things to be said to do global design and the same experience for everyone. But I personally think that having locale specific designs and very personal skills is is more is more appropriate mm. to the interface and also it's it, it's i mean these smart speakers are in our homes it's a very personal thing i think the more personalization the better mm. i mean people who like the skill are not going to be happy with that i know but <laughs> <laughs> So, but, but I think that there's a time when user experience has to come before scaling, right? Yeah, certainly in, in uh, the days that we're in now where, you know, it's kind of having to prove itself first, isn't it, before before the scale comes, I think. It's working on a yeah. smaller scale. Um, yeah, unfortunately not everyone sees it that way. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, um, have you got kind of any examples where you've worked on so you, we, we've spoke about taking x factor out for example because that's not a reference for france for, for example and have you got any kind of examples you can think of where you've inputted something that is more relevant in france for example into into the uh into that version oh yeah yeah um i mean you'll have to play the French would you rather skill <laughs> to, <laughs> to get a hang of that. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, basically we have a few like 
very typical French would you rather's, mm -hmm. like very typical cultural dilemmas going on in our country. I mean, as we're going to the world, towards the World Cup of football, for example, mm -hmm. we have two very strong football teams in in France, mm -hmm. which are Paris and Marseille, and they, they've been historically, I mean, opposed mm -hmm. since forever. Mm -hmm. So, so th that's kind of that's kind of the typical elements I, I like to put in, like mm -hmm. because it was a, a, a game of opposites, which rather. Uh, that that's kind of what I was looking at, uh, but there's little stuff that make the the culture really rich, and mm. and I think putting in some context is always very nice. Mm. Yeah, sounds good. Have you have you done much, Justin, in terms of um, translating or or trans creating uh, voice experiences? You know, I started and then it came to that issue that we sort of touched on earlier. Uh, I am not sure how to break the rules in French well enough uh, that I feel really comfortable, right? Because mm -hmm. so much of the conversational, especially on the voice side, is is knowing where to break the rules, where people uh, make mistakes in the language that is completely natural, mm -hmm. more yeah. natural than following the rules. And it's so it's so tricky if you're not really uh, fluent, or mm -hmm. even if you didn't completely grow up. You know, I have French coworkers who super super smart people, mm -hmm. uh, but you notice things in their in their English that you go immediately, oh, you like you didn't grow up speaking English, right? Yeah, exactly, and I totally agree. Um, I, I I for one think that you should always be on the lookout for someone who's at least lived in the country for long enough to have a real feel of what the culture is like, of what, how you can break the rules, as you say, where you can and where you can't, mm. uh, where you can play around with words, where you can't, where it sounds a bit off or not. So we've spoke about, we touched on a few challenges in terms of you know the the cultural references and some things exist in one country that might not be relevant in another country what are some of the other challenges that that you will face uh when you are trans creating uh, a voice first experience i mean we've touched on, uh, on a few already like words that don't exist etc well like mental models as well uh a persona doesn't per se exist in one country versus another one. Let me give you an example. Um, in Belgium and in the north of France as well, the postman is someone who is really, really close to the people because uh, traditionally it's the person who came along uh, in, in the homes of people to give their, their pension check. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there's a very close relationship with the postman. Uh, today still uh, in those northern regions. Whereas in, in in the south, and I think it's the same thing in the UK, the postman's just the person that brings your post into your post box, right? Mm -hmm. So so if you if you'd have for a voice skill a postman as a persona uh, in Belgium, uh, it would be a very familiar person who knows everything about you, uh, who you can talk to, uh, about who knows your friends, your family, your address, your neighbours, uh, last time the doctor came by, uh, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, in the UK, if you'd have to use the same, you'd use the same persona and tell people, oh, it's a postman. They they'd be really weird about it. The mental model is not the same at all. Mm. That's that's interesting. That because yeah, in Eng in English, if the persona was a postman, it would be essentially almost a little bit like a a sort of almost like Alexa is now in some instances where you ask it a question, you get a response. If something's being delivered, do you know what I mean? It's like a quick transaction. It's over and done with, um, and it's you wouldn't think of it as being 
personalized or you know close yeah. to you or anything like that <clears throat> what about the you've got another interesting one which is a butler yeah yeah <laughs> which is <laughs> exactly um well a butler in england i mean you 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 obviously know what it is it's a very set mental model isn't it mm-hmm. it's something you've known for ages um where in where in france i mean some rich families had what we called a majordome mm-hmm. but it's not a, a widespread mental model uh, i mean we have no idea what what a butler actually is and what he actually does we have mm-hmm. this vague idea about a person standing in the room with a towel over his arm and <laughs> that that's about it uh, so yeah when, when making a skill uh, for for service kind of a service skill or mm. hotel reservation or booking uh butlers could be a very interesting persona in the uk whereas in, in other european european countries it would be it would have to be more the like the hotel receptionist or like the, it would would be it would have to be adapted because butlering is obviously not the right way to go. Mm. There was an interesting Wally Brill from Google uh, at the um, Google I.O. Uh, summit or conference or whatever mm-hmm. it was a few few weeks back. He was doing a, um, a presentation on personas and that was the exact persona that, that he gave an example of for an airline um, for one airline who was more of a straight-talking business airline, the other airline was more of a young, hip, cheap kind of 18 to 30s kind of airline. Um, and the one that they went for and the example he gave for the kind of business-like airline was exactly that, Albert the Butler, I think they called him. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting because that would that seemingly then would be a difficult thing to translate into French. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think you'd have to go more where it's stewardess, who, who that or steward for that matter, mm. would be like more accepted and more. It can be. I mean, it can be a fancy steward, <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, a butler is really hard to get our minds wrapped up around. Yeah. And you mentioned some examples um, of words that that don't exist or do exist in in different languages. Um, have you, can I you can think give of you some if you want? Yeah, to. yeah, yeah. Go on. Yeah, give us give us a few examples. So, like a few words that exist in English and that you'll only find in English. It's for example, cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cheesy. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have we don't have anything quite quite as cheesy. Also, serendipity is something that's typical of the English language. All right. Which is kind of which is kind of frustrating because I really like serendipity. I mean, it's 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 a very happy, mm. feel good word, isn't it? It almost sounds a bit French as well, though, doesn't it? Serendipity. Yeah, it does. It does, but it is not. <laughs> Wicked. Yeah, and, and the others that come in back. fact, in fact, uh, serendipity. It's it's uh, it's it's originally uh, an, from an ancient name in Sri Lanka called serendip, oh. and in in the eighteenth century, Horace Walpole popularized the word. In a in a folk folk tale he made about three princes, right? So yeah, it's mm. it's very very British. Yeah, as, as a <laughs> as, as a word. <laughs> That's interesting. And, and a very and a word uh, a very like a very silly word I really like is hilly billy hillbilly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> hillbilly. <laughs> Yeah, so that presumably doesn't have a, a, a French equivalent. No, it's it does it doesn't. It, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, it's really it's really interesting to to search for these kind of yeah, words and, yeah. and and come and come up with alternatives, like things that might be a bit close to them, but mm. 
don't quite you don't get quite get the same feel and and that's why it's so important to get the feel of of a skill when you're transcreating it mm. it's not about one word it's about the entire experience mm. so if you're stuck like on just one word or one sentence uh, when you only have the written scripts for example I mean, you want it to be be perfect. So you get stuck on these sentences and you get stuck on these kind of wording and phrasing and you know it doesn't quite feel that right, but Mm. because you don't have the context, well, you can't do it any other way. Mm. Yeah. And and then on the other hand, a few words that that don't exist uh, in English. Um... We have we have a French word that's called Seigneur Terrasse. Mm-hmm. And in fact, Seigneur Terrasse, that's people who who spend like hours and hours spotting the white fly purchasing only one drink <laughs> uh, in cafes or bars. <laughs> but it's it's basically yeah. coffee shop spotters a bit. Yeah. yeah. So we have a French word for that, that's Seigneur Terrasse. <laughs> Seigneur Terrasse, I like that. There's a few <laughs> of them in some of the dwellers. <laughs> <coughs> I've got well, another... yeah, we, 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 we have a word for it yeah. so there, there might be uh, quite a few more uh, <laughs> in there's, France there's, an, there's another word for that in English it's called cheapskate <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, there's a, for example there's a word also in, in German that's called Kummerspeck Kummerspeck in fact Speck is bacon Oh, right. and it's, it's, if you translate it literally it's grief bacon <laughs> and in fact, it means it means the extra pounds you put on from overeating <laughs> that's class so i've got i found another couple of those kind of words and i think this is an interesting discussion because it, it really it's it's convincing me now that the whole concept of this po- this episode was really to convince people of why they should do it and and why it's so important. I think that we're kind of getting into some of the real decent details here. So I've got a couple of interesting examples of words that exist in other languages that don't exist in English, <clears throat> because obviously we use Mau Mau as an example. So Florian Holland has created this card game Mau Mau, uh, which is popular in, in Germany. If you were to translate something like that into English, you may well have similar kind of um situations where there's words being used that might not translate it's kind of yeah from one to another. so i'm going to give you a bit of a test J- dustin do you speak any other languages apart from french no okay well you, you can still have a go <laughs> 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 micah this one's right up your alley right it's german and the word is fernware fernware can you say that again fernware so I think I don't even know I'm pronouncing it right. F E R N W E H Fernware or Fernware. No googling. <laughs> I know, I know, no googling. I, I, I have no idea what that means. I might, I might be pronouncing it completely wrong. There'll be a lot of German people listening to this thing. What the hell is he saying? But <laughs> it means it's the feeling you get from being homesick from a place oh, that, that you've oh, never yeah, been to. Say again. Wonderlust. Wonderlust. And, and you actually pronounce it fernwe. Fernwe. Okay. So the feeling you get from being homesick from a place you've never been to. I love that. Yeah. One. Um. This is a good one, and I'd I'd never even come across this language. Pa- pasqu pasquens. Pasquens is is the language. I I don't know. Pasquens. I think it is. Anyway, the word is tingo. And it means to gradually steal all the possessions out of a neighbor's house by borrowing them one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good one. Um, there's another few decent ones. Uh, let me just have a look. Uh, this one, you, you, you'll know this one. And again, forgive the uh, pronunciation. Back Pfeifengeschicht. Back Pfeifengeschicht. It's German. Back five finger shift. It means a face badly in need of a fist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why don't we have these words in English? A face badly in need uh, of a fist. A back five finger shift. Gesicht. Um, in fact, is uh, someone who gets uh, gets bullied bullied a lot. All oh, right. Mm. All oh, right. Fair enough. 
So that translation on here might be a little bit different then. This one's a good one. This is what I tend to do quite a lot. This I mean, one... it's, it's, a, it's like it's like when you you when when you're a person who's taken advantage of a lot. Oh. So like you get bullied into things. Oh right, okay then. So they've translated that slightly wrong then, because they've they've translated this as a face badly in need of a fist. As in. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's kind of that, isn't it? It's a, yeah. uh, I mean, it's it's like it's written all over you that you're someone <laughs> who should be hit in the face. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, the, the, that's violent, though. Yeah, right? yeah, it is. Yeah, that's a bit of a yeah. Okay. So the last one, then. This one is French, and it is it's Riasons de Bas. Wait there, Riasons Sabab. Dustin, what do you think? Raya songs de Bob. I don't know. I can't, I can't quite. Can't yeah, quite I can't it. make it out. Well, maybe it's my pronunciation again. <laughs> Have, it's it's hard enough pronouncing French when you don't speak French, but being northern and trying to pronounce it <laughs> is even worse. Maybe if I give you the definition, you might know. Uh, the definition is, is uh, to laugh in your beard quietly whilst thinking about something that happened in the past. Oh, it, yeah, it's uh, Rive dans, dans sa barbe. Right. Say that again? Rive dans sa barbe. Right, Rive dans sa barbe. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's my pronunciation. It's an expression. Words. And it means? It's an expression. It's uh, like chuckling a bit. All right. <laughs> cool. I think, I think this website must have uh, kind of glorified some of this. A little bit <laughs> but it's a good example of how there are words that exist in one language that don't exist in another language and we're probably using them without even realizing it and when it comes to translating these things um it's a lot more work than just translating a script isn't it i think that kind of yeah so. yeah it is it is so what about then let's j jump forward and we've we've done the we've discussed the challenges and the differences in different languages and we've kind of spoke a bit about the process and the workflow that you would go through to uh, translate these uh, skills. Do you do any form of testing once you've got to a point? I mean, obviously, it, it'll, it'll work for you because you've kind of done the transcreation side of it. But do you do anything to further prove that? that uh that it works oh yeah yeah and i mean i i te i test even while while doing the transcreation i mean a lot of design is about user testing for me it's from from the get-go and afterwards and i mean every ux designer will tell you this mm -hmm. but you're never right as mm -hmm. a designer I mean, you you you're always proven wrong. Mm. Uh, there's a nice cartoon out there with, with someone doing user testing, and then the 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 designer observing the scene, thinking, "No, that's not how you're supposed to do it." <laughs> mm. Yeah. Because I I mean, everyone, every single person, no matter how smart, no matter how many like degrees or courses you've been through about design or or whatever your background is is going to prepare you for what real users really want you know what you want i mean you've been you for quite a long time so hopefully you know uh but you're not everyone else and i know that this kind of sounds really straightforward yet it isn't mm. uh, because a lot of people think that because they like it inevitably a lot of people are going to like it mm. which, which is not quite true and I, and it's not but because you get a function or something and you know how to action something that someone else does mm. and and so that's why user testing is so very important uh, from the beginning and then even afterwards because you always have to tweak things and things always go unexpectedly and even more so in voice because you kind of when you're designing for voice you kind of have to predict what people are going to say right and that's really hard because you only have your background your family's background your friend's background but you you, you don't really have a lot of 
data to go in if you don't do user testing. Mm. And I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people I know that are in the voice uh, area or even in the conversation area like chatbots and, and whatnot, they tell me, oh, but we've got analytics. <laughs> and, and then, I mean, it's so frustrating. Okay, you've got data and that's great. I mean, we all need data and analytics to make things better. But what data doesn't tell you is the emotion people and the, the experience people go through while engaging with your skill. I mean, you can see this or that, they said this or that, and it was on par, so not understood. Mm. But you don't see the frustration that build up inside of them. And you don't, you don't see that they are so frustrated with your skill that they're never going to use it again. Mm. So, so yeah, I, 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 I'm a big fan of user testing. I mean, this is kind of my everyday battle trying to make mm. brands see that they need to do user testing mm. and that users are not empl- employees of yeah. the brand. Mm. Yeah. Is there anything that you would... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I went on a bit of a rant because no, no. <laughs> I'm really passionate about this. Yeah, so. no, that's that's <laughs> good. That is good. Is there anything that you would need to consider differently when you are user testing a trans-created skill? Um, I mean, yeah, because um, what, what, what I'm advocating is to have user tests and user groups in each locale so you wouldn't like be able to do a user test in the uk uh for a french skill i mean you need people who are actually french to do it like dustin said earlier i mean a lot, uh, some of his co-workers that are French, but that speak English. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they're engaging with an English skill, there's some subtleties they're not going to pick up on. Uh, some things that that won't sound right to them, uh, although they are. So that that that's uh, that's why I highly really recommend having user groups mm. in each locale you you're working for. Mm. And would you? Would you do that testing remotely or would you recommend having some like a resource over in those different locales that can actually do the testing kind of one on one? I mean, you can do both. There's a lot of very nice remote testing tools out there now. Um but there's nothing as good as first hand experience, right? I mean, you can do remotely, you can also I mean it people have this idea that user testing is this thing that has an enormous cost that needs 10,000 resources and that it's going to be very uh, a big investment but yeah. uh, it's it's i mean it's it's really not i mean you can do user testing with five people uh, already have quite a good feel of what it's going to be like and uh, the, the great thing with voice is that you can do Wizard of Oz testing, which is not costly at all. Mm. So you, you can play out the, the interaction and see how the conversation goes. That, that's the great thing about, about voice. You don't need to make 10,000 uh, graphical prototypes and studios and whatnot. I mean... User testing for voice is even easier, and that's why I understand even less why brands are not doing it massively. Mm. Is, there, is there anything else before we kind of wrap up that, that we haven't covered? Dustin, have you got anything that, that we haven't quite touched on yet? No, I think we touched we touched on a lot. We really went <laughs> in depth, and I think it was great. <laughs> Wicked. Uh, finally then, Micah, what would be your single most important piece of advice to a brand or a skill developer or somebody who is creating uh, in one language and is is thinking about doing some kind of trans creation what would your kind of your most important piece of advice be to them my most important advice would be look into the experience first before looking into the language 
good. Wicked. Sounds good. Fantastic. Micah, where can people reach out to you and follow what you're up to? Oh, uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tweeting quite a bit at the moment. So Twitter is a good, uh, a good place to find me. Uh, my, my Twitter handle is Micah Dufour. So at Micah Dufour. And you can reach me by mail at Micah at UXMyBot.com. Cool. Fantastic. Micah, thank you so much. That was an absolutely fantastic discussion. Bags and bags of insight, as Dustin said. Really, really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us today. Thank you so much. Uh, no worries. It, it was a pleasure being being with you. Wicked. I really like what you're doing with the podcast and making people and brands aware of how Voice First is going and what, what direction it should take. I really liked your what you post your video on LinkedIn uh, with the railway demo. Uh, thought yes. it was really... <laughs> thank you, thank really, you, yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, so it was really interesting and really to the point. That was Micah Defua talking about internationalizing your voice-first experience. What an episode that was. That was absolutely unbelievable. I'm, I'm so glad we got into the detail that we got into in terms of you know some words being available available in one language that don't have a translation in that language and then cultural references that apply in one place don't apply in another place and then just understanding the general feeling and the experience of the skill before translating a word and why you shouldn't be translating uh, word for word and why you should be taking into consideration the whole experience and trying to transcreate i love that word transcreate the experience um, it has never been more important to be doing this kind of work because we've spoke about how global the voice first ecosystem is and how global the internet is um, there is absolutely no reason really why if most brands are global um, and you, you should really be wanting as many people as possible to be using your voice first experiences so there's no reason why trans creating uh, your skill or action or your whatever it is that you're working on um, shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be considered. I'm sure this will become a practice um, over the next few years. Certainly with with the big brands who are creating in this space, you know the trans creation or translation or however you want to phrase it will become common practice as it is already for many brands. Um, so thank you, Micah, for taking the time to speak to us today. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, Dustin, for co-hosting once again. And thank you all for listening. Until next time, until next week, we'll see you later.